According to Sartre, each and every single one of us is condemned to be free and therefore responsible for our essence, which is an all-inclusive term that defines our individual personhood. So he says that we are without excuse for the collection of choices that become the first-person narrative of our lives, since, among other things, there is no fundamental human nature which he can identify, or at least choose to acknowledge, such as one ordained by a divine creator. As we discussed in class, however, even if we do not feel comfortable with the language that Sartre uses to describe our freedom, we should ask ourselves if we are, in fact, really so without excuse. In other words, let's look beyond Sartre now and consider the more general question of what kinds of inborn biological variables or environmental conditions could either enhance or handicap us from being so completely responsible for our identities. At a glance, this seems to be no more or less than the classic nature versus nurture debate. However, it's much more than that. We are also considering whether or not we can be responsible for our identities. That is, do we possess free will? Are we free to take an active role in the creation of ourselves, to be able, therefore, to own our identities? After all, isn't that sort of the point of having a so-called personal identity? In nature versus nurture, it's clear that we do not take an active role in deciding our own natures prior to our birth, and it's not really clear if nurture is a term describing things that are done to us rather than events in which we actively choose to participate. Sleeping Giant has a unique identity, characteristics and features that are recognizable and distinct from other mountains. But we wouldn't say that it has a personal identity because mountains do not take an active role in their own formation. Mountains are passive and are acted upon by forces because they do not have any agency. They do not have a mind or any internal motivation to act. Now, before diving into Arthur Schopenhauer's essay on the freedom of the will, which you read for this session, it is necessary for us here to take a step back and more clearly define what exactly it is we are addressing in the debate about free will to prevent any future confusions. When we say that we are determined to act and to be a certain way, we are not talking about fatalism, about fate or karma or destiny or predestination as authored by some divine will. In other words, by determinism in the debate about the existence of free will, philosophers are specifically interested in natural causation, which are the proper objects of observation and analysis. Supernatural causes mysterious, magical, and miraculous fate or destiny are by definition transcendent above and over natural causes and not what we are talking about in the debate about free will. You see, there is only one constant, one universal, it is the only real truth, causality. Action, reaction, cause, and effect. Everything begins with choice. No, wrong. Choice is an illusion. Cause and effect. Every cause is the effect of some preceding cause, and every effect is the cause for further effects. And it is rarely the case that only one cause is involved in an effect. A possibly endless number of causes give rise to an equally infinite possible number of effects. Right now, even though you're not aware of it, you are affected by the composition of the air you breathe, by your own physiology and metabolism, by gravity, by the ambient temperature, by your past experiences, and so on. Each of those causes are the effects of other causes, cause and effect. For example, are you choosing to blink your eyes right now? You could think that, and you could even try to resist the natural urge to blink. But there are causes and effects there too, stretching back millions and millions of years, all the way back to the first creatures to evolve these wet, gelatinous orbs we call eyes, 
that required regular moisturizing and cleaning by blinking. Every day, we find ourselves saying or hearing other people saying things like, everything happens for a reason. In determinism, we mean just that, everything happens due to some causal reason. Dinosaurs, which were awesome, went extinct some 65 million years ago. This happened for a reason. Scientists have made some very logical inferences about what the causes might have been. Some type of cataclysmic event, like a giant asteroid hitting the planet, rapid and radical change in climate, widespread disease, or some combination of the above. On the other hand, what fatalists mean by everything happens for a reason is more accurately understood as everything happens for some purpose, even justified purpose. So applied to the extinction of the dinosaurs, what they mean is the dinosaurs went extinct for a purposeful reason, in order that mammals could inherit the earth so that 65 million years later, we could use their liquefied remains to fuel our engines. Now, but attributing that kind of intentionality to happenings is an act of faith, which is perfectly fine, but it's also not philosophy. Please be very, very careful to make sure that you understand this difference between determinism and fatalism. Saying that it rained yesterday for a reason in determinism, that is, in accordance with meteorological science, is one thing. Saying that it rained yesterday for a reason, or for the purpose of making sure that my tomato garden would thrive, or because Mother Nature answered my prayers for rain, are very different statements. There is also a lot of room for confusion with the term predetermined. Again, when we say that the sun, for example, is predetermined to become a red giant before probably going nova about 7.6 billion years from now, it is a factual scientific statement based on astronomy and stellar physics. This is very different from the notion that such future is predestined by God or some other anthropomorphic notion of nature as a conscious, rational agent that is willing or planning for this to happen. Back to personal identity and free will. If we are no more or less than complex biochemical machines that behave in predictable ways, and both our physiology and psychology are indeed quite predictable, and predictable enough to sustain an extensive list of biological, neurological, and behavioral sciences, then isn't it reasonable to conclude that there is no free will? Is this what Schopenhauer meant when he wrote that everything that happens, happens necessarily?